Is there a growing body of evidence for the existence of Bigfoot? If Bigfoot is real, how come we still have not found a body or any conclusive evidence? Is the fact that Bigfoot sightings happen all around the U.S. and even other parts of the world reason enough to believe it exists and that there are fairly large numbers of these creatures? Is there a reason to believe that these creatures may even harness paranormal or supernatural qualities as some have suggested? Longtime Bigfoot researcher and Minnesota native Mike Quash joins me to tackle some of these questions and more on this episode of Passion for the Paranormal. Well, greetings fellow truth seekers and welcome once again to Passion for the Paranormal, bringing a passion for the paranormal to you. I'm your host, Curry Stegan, and uh, wow, it's great to be back here with you once again. Hope everybody had a wonderful and safe uh, Thanksgiving holiday. And man, we are uh, just about uh, finishing up with 2021, just a little over a month ago, and it's in the record books. Uh, so 2022, uh, bring it on. And uh, I've got Mike Quast joining me tonight, and Mike is a longtime Bigfoot researcher and has written several books on uh, his uh, Bigfoot uh reports he's gathered and his research. It's going to be great to talk with Mike and I uh, haven't covered the Bigfoot subject for quite a while on the show. So I'm really looking forward to talking with him. Uh, there's an interesting development. Uh, the Pentagon has now said they have developed a new group. It's uh, what we knew of the UOP task force. The Pentagon has now established uh, what it is calling the Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group. Wow, say that uh, real fast five times. Uh, the, the aim of this group is to look at reports of UAPs near U.S. military facilities and operations. And uh, wow, that's uh, quite, a, quite a mouthful, that acronym. Um, they are going to be synchronizing efforts across the Department of Defense and the broader U.S. government to detect, identify, and uh, attribute objects of interest in special use airspace. And uh, they also are going to assess and mitigate any associated threats to safety of flight and national security. So interesting stuff, uh, how this is going to differ from the formerly established UAP task force, your guess is as good as mine, but it will be interesting to see how this develops. All right, if you haven't been over to the website yet, please visit us at passion, the number four, theparanormal.com. Uh, make sure to sign up for a free newsletter, and uh, there you can also catch up with some past episodes, and uh, hopefully you'll visit us on the website, and uh, you can also catch us on Facebook at facebook.com slash passion, the number four, the paranormal. And uh, if you're uh, talking with friends, family members, coworkers, and uh, you think they might be interested in tuning into the show, please just simply share a link with them. Also, uh, whatever podcast app you're using out there, and we're pretty much on all of them, just make sure you simply hit that subscribe button uh, so you can get notified of new episodes or when those new episodes drop. And uh, I'm really looking forward to getting into the discussion with Mike. He's, uh, I think he's a wealth of information on the Bigfoot subject. And uh, he has really done a lot of investigating and researching in his home state of Minnesota. I think he's got four books to his name on the subject. So uh, I'm really eager to get into this discussion and uh, really hope you enjoy tonight's uh, episode. And thank you so much for tuning into the show. Okay, so uh, joining me tonight is uh, Mike Quast. Mike has been a Bigfoot researcher for over 30 years now. He is a lifelong resident of Minnesota and had a sighting of a Bigfoot at the early age of eight. Mike has written several books on the Bigfoot subject to include one of his most recent books, Bigfoot Chronicle, a researcher's continuing journey through Minnesota and beyond, where he documents nearly 700 Bigfoot sightings throughout the state. Mike, thank you so much for joining me. Sure, nice to be here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's great to, to have you joining me. Uh, I, it's been a while since I've covered this topic on the show, but uh, it is, it, it's, it's one that always does intrigue me. Uh, and uh, I live in northern Utah. We've had our fair share of sightings in this area. And uh, I want to go back because I think you talk a little bit about in your book that Minnesota seems to be, there seems to be the elements in place there uh, for these Bigfoot to to actually, you know, roam or, or be or exist in that area. But I want to get back to, before we kind of get into that discussion, I want to get back to, you had an, uh, 
you had a sighting at an early age. Uh, take us back. I think this was age of eight. Is that right? Right, in 1976. Yeah, take us back to that sighting. What happened uh, in that, that sighting you had? Well, it was actually a fairly mundane Bigfoot sighting, as Bigfoot sightings go. Um, I was with my parents and my sister, and we were just out for a Sunday drive in the um, Strawberry Lake area of Becker County, Minnesota. It was a very wooded area. Um, and I had no idea at the time that there have been other Bigfoot reports in that area, but at the time, I just knew from books and movies and things like that that Bigfoot was mainly a Pacific Northwest phenomenon, and I was interested in it already because I've always been just kind of naturally drawn to those kinds of what you might call fringe subjects. Um, but so I'm, I'm in the back seat of this car. My parents are in the front. My sister is next to me. And for some reason, I've I was the only person in the car who saw what was up ahead of us at the side of the road. I just suddenly saw this dark black upright figure standing right at the edge of the road, about seven feet tall, I would estimate, and maybe 150 yards away. And at first, I thought it was a burned blackened tree trunk because that's what it looked like at that distance. But then it after a few seconds, it walked away from the road into the woods on two legs. I didn't see any arms swinging. I know a lot of people say they swing their arms when they walk. But this one must have been holding them by its sides. And I was so stunned about it, what, it, what I was seeing, and I didn't even say anything at the time. When we reached that spot, I looked into the woods, and I didn't see it again. And it was only later that I told people what I had seen. And I could tell it wasn't a person in a costume and it wasn't a bear because it had much longer legs than, a, than an upright bear. And uh, a Bigfoot was the only thing I could think of that it could have been. Now, uh, was this kind of frightening to you at the time, Mike? Or what? how were you kind of taking this? How, as, as an eight-year-old, I can imagine that has the potential, seems it would have the potential to be a little bit frightening to see that. But... Um, what was kind of your reaction seeing it? Was it a little bit frightening? or? I don't remember feeling fear. I just remember being kind of shocked into silence by what I had seen. Yeah, and uh, you've done a lot of research in the state of Minnesota on Bigfoot. I'm sure you've done a lot of research just in general. Have you heard of any other sightings in all your research in that general area where you saw the Bigfoot? I have heard of a couple others in that exact same area uh, that were also, I think, in the 1970s. Okay. And uh, now, Mike, is this kind of what catapulted you into the subject? Had you even at an early age heard of Bigfoot? Uh, did, you, did you hear of other people talking about it? Where were you kind of uh, at that age, you know, seeing a Bigfoot? I was already somewhat into it, um, had read the books that were in my school library, and there were a lot of documentary films out at the time, like uh, there was one called The Mysterious Monsters that was really popular, that was in theaters, and yeah, so I was, I was already studying the subject, but having my own sighting might have really gone a long way to cementing me becoming an actual researcher when I grew up. Now, I'm assuming you at a very early age how how early of an age did you actually get started really researching this well probably right around that that part of my life uh once i was in school and you know pretty much since i learned to read i was reading books on that subject you know around age six seven probably wow and there was a lot a lot on tv about it at the time that i just ate up and I've always just been naturally drawn to paranormal type topics like UFOs and ghosts and monsters and things like that. You know, have you had you had talked to anybody else who had had sightings at that point, or was that pretty much the your sighting the first uh, in the area you'd heard of? Yeah, I hadn't met any other witnesses yet at that time. When do you actually go out and start up? Because I'm assuming you actually go out. On, uh, I mean, do you go out on adventures looking for the, the Bigfoot? And if so, when did you start doing that? Yeah, I graduated high school in 1986, and I 
I think it was in 87 when I really started going out. Um, the, the way I started was looking in books for Minnesota reports that had been described in print and then going to those areas and camping out and hiking around and looking for evidence and also, to the extent that I could, looking up the witnesses that if they were named, seeing if they were still around and, and um, trying to get their accounts of their stories. But as time went by, I just got better and better at it, at just kind of sniffing out information and you know, looking at other other researchers' um, files and, and so forth and following up on their reports. And over time, over more than 30 years now, it has amounted to over 700 Bigfoot reports for the state of Minnesota. Wow, and that's interesting, Mike, because uh, there is a map that you find on the Internet where they list Bigfoot sightings. Uh, you know, and again, I don't know, you know, where this information comes from, but you can find it on a Google search where it will tell you how many sightings have been, there have been by state. Uh, so that sounds like a lot more sightings than you would... Uh, than what you're talking about here, if you go on to that source. It is something I found on Google where you can actually see a map uh, of Bigfoot sightings per state. And I know it's always like the Pacific Northwest. You always, you, you know, you look at Oregon, Washington, you know, California. Uh, you always see, you know, big numbers there. And then as you start to go further across the U.S., it seems like you don't see near as many. Uh, and that, so that's interesting. You've had a lot of uh, witness reports. And how long, over, over what time period are we talking about for those numbers of uh, witnesses or, or reports? Well, the, what, over what time period did the sightings take place, you mean? Yeah, like you said, uh, I think you said uh, up to 700 reports. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, we're talking reports here. I have a few from way back in the early 1900s. Uh, before that, there's Native American mythology that is hundreds of years old. I think people, it's not that they weren't happening in the early 20th century, but I think people started reporting it more in the, like, around the 1970s when the subject was getting a lot of press. Uh, so that's when there's, there started to be way more reports in Minnesota, and it's been a, just a steady climb since then. Um, throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, and there there are reports that are currently going on right now. Um, for the past two years, I've been uh, going up to a place by the, a few miles from the town of Black Duck in northern Minnesota, where there's a private property there, where there's been Bigfoot activity going on since 2013. And that's what my most recent book is about. Uh, it's called Sasquatch Central, High Strangeness at a Northern Minnesota Homestead. And the most recent sighting there was just on Halloween, just, um, just this month, or last month, I should say. Now, Mike, you've all of these reports that you've gathered and you put together, are you pretty much doing this alone? Do you work with kind of a group of people like some do, or are you pretty much just a solo researcher? I am pretty much solo. Um, I have a best friend named Dean who I've mentioned in my, my books who comes with me on uh, searches sometimes. And he's kind of an agnostic. He doesn't believe or disbelieve. He just he wants to see one. And he, in order to believe in it, you know, he needs to see one to believe. But he, he doesn't rule it out that they're real, and he's curious enough to go searching with me. Um, but I'm, for the most part, solo. Okay. Yeah, interesting. And and have you found that, I mean, that sightings are pretty rare, aren't they? Well, yeah, the average person is probably never going to see a Bigfoot. And even though there's 700 reports in Minnesota and uh, and there's states with way more reports than that, like in the Northwest, yeah, it is still a rare event. But you can get quite a few sightings built up over over several years that make it sound more common than it is, I suppose. Yeah, and I guess the other thing I was getting at here, too, is not just for, you know, the, the ordinary person, but even a person like yourself who actually goes out and actively researches areas trying to find evidence or, or have a sighting. Uh, it's even rarer for some of the researchers. Isn't that true? Yeah, I'd say most researchers 
never succeed in having their own sightings, but a few do. Yeah, and so, and I've had a few uh, Bigfoot uh, authors slash researchers on the show in the past, and uh, yeah, it does seem to be a pretty rare occurrence where you see one. Now, you're as you go out and uh, you know you're going out and trying to find evidence. What are some of the things? How do you? Well, first of all, how do you go about? doing that kind of give us what uh, a little bit about what your starting point is when you go out to do this for the most part i'll just choose an area where there have been a lot of reports um and preferably a, a state or national forest where you can just go hiking wherever you want to and don't need permission to be on the land and um just go find a trail and just hike around and look for evidence look for tracks or Stick structures, uh, that's kind of a controversial, controversial thing that Bigfoot builds these pyramid-like structures out of sticks, but I've seen a lot of those that I think are genuine. Uh, you listen for sounds, and uh, at that place up by Black Duck that I mentioned, I've heard a lot of sounds up there. I've not had a sighting up there yet, but I've heard more Bigfoot sounds or what I believe to be genuine Bigfoot sounds up there at that one property than I have heard in my whole 30 plus years of research. Um, you, you hear a lot about a wood knocking, and that Bigfoot bangs on trees with sticks. I had never heard that before until my very first visit to the Black Duck site, and now I've heard it half a dozen times up there. Before I became aware of that site, one of my most um, commonly visited research areas was the Chippewa National Forest. There's a little uh, native village called Bina up there, and there's been a a lot of sightings right around there. Um, Back around 2010, I believe it was, um, some tracks were found by a road grader operator that got covered by the press. It was on the TV news and in the newspapers, and it's hard to say why some reports will light a fire under people and, and others don't, but that one just really, it got so widely reported that um, the place became kind of famous for Bigfoot and witnesses that had sightings in years past started coming forward and telling their story. So I still go up there quite a bit. Yeah. Now, Mike, um, when people report these to you, are they sometimes, do you find that are, it's people that either they witnessed one of these things and they were not a believer before and do you see once they report these to you or you take the reports from them, that they seem to now be a believer? Are, are you experiencing that with some of these reports? Yeah, you hear a lot of people say that they were not believers before they had their own sighting. And some of the most exciting stories that, that I hear are the, from the people who say, I went from being a total unbeliever to a total believer in Bigfoot in the space of one second, as soon as I saw what I saw. Or maybe, or, you know, most people are aware just from the culture that this thing called Bigfoot is is part of our popular culture and and that some people believe in it and some people don't, but they they maybe never really form their own opinion of what they think about it at all. They're just kind of aware of it until they finally see something. You know, uh, Mike, when you you have some of these reports, uh, are, are people sometimes reporting of odd smells? You hear about... Bigfoot having a, a foul odor a lot, and people joke about it a lot, um, but actually most reports don't mention any kind of odor, but the ones that do are, people take note of that. Um, at the Black Duck site, there have been a couple of sightings where nobody smelled anything until suddenly there was a close-up sighting, and suddenly the smell was there, and and as soon as the creature leaves, it's gone again. And it almost seems like the smell is something that they might be able to turn on and off, like it's some kind of defense mechanism. Interesting. So that's just a theory, but it's, it's one that I consider. Now, uh, and the other thing I want to ask about is, uh, what about, you hear some people say they believe these Bigfoot are fairly territorial. Um, in other words, um, they might even perhaps maybe become aggressive if you come into their uh, territory or you may have reason to be to, to fear them if you are in their territory. What's kind of your sense of that? I mean, all the years of research you've done it, uh, do you think these 
Bigfoot tend to be fair, fairly territorial. Uh, what's kind of your sense on it? Obviously, something of that size could, if it attacked a person, you would have no chance against it unless you managed to shoot it, maybe. But you just you don't see a record of it happening. Um, you know, attacks on people, you just don't hear about them. The most common thing that happens when there's a sighting is that the Bigfoot and the person see each other and the Bigfoot quickly takes off, just like most wild animals do. Um, but there are some reports where they do seem territorial and don't want people in their territory and will not attack, but will get aggressive, kind of like gorillas in Africa do. Um, like, they'll make bluff charges or, or they'll throw things, they'll throw rocks or sticks. Um, but nobody ever seems to get hurt. It's just uh, like an intimidation move. Um, African gorillas will do the same thing. They'll, uh, like for people who who study gorillas long term, like um, Diane Fossey did, once in a while, like the big male gorilla of the group will get annoyed with the human presence and make a bluff charge and come right up to the person. But if they stay their ground, the gorilla stops and doesn't know what to do because he expected that to scare them off. Um, I haven't really heard of anybody standing their ground with a Bigfoot like that, but there there have been uh, what seem to be bluff charges because you think they could easily catch a person if they wanted to. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, treat them, treat them like a bear. When you see a bear in the woods, it's usually going to run away, but if you if you taunt it, if you mess with it too much, you're probably going to get hurt. Now, would you advise people going into the woods in some of these areas you go into to carry firearms, to not carry firearms? I mean, are these areas where there's also bear? Um, what would be, what would you tell a person going to that area, especially if they want to go in trying to find evidence of Bigfoot? I think it's a good idea to carry a gun in the in the woods uh, just in case you run into a bear or a mountain lion or something like that just for personal protection. Um, again, from that black duck case that's going on, the, the landowner that lives there is convinced that Bigfoot knows what guns are and doesn't like them and that you're probably less likely to see one if you are carrying a gun. Now, what about the, uh, I've heard reports of people saying they really do not like dogs. Um, if you bring dogs in the area, their dogs could even be in danger. What's kind of your, what is your sense of that? There are several reports of uh, dogs reacting to them. Some, it depends on the courage of the dog. Some dogs, once they get a whiff of them, will put their tail between their legs and run into the house and just hide in terror. And if a dog is more brave um, and freaking out, barking at it, the Bigfoot will probably run away. But there are a very small number of stories that I've heard, and I can't remember any specific ones off the top of my head, but I know I've heard them of dogs being attacked and killed by Bigfoots. I'm not sure if there are any of those actually in Minnesota, but it's alleged to have happened at least a few times. Yeah, I, you know, I also so want there, to... There is, a, there, there is a, a video that somebody shot, uh, I think it was at, at Christmas time, somewhere in the Arrowhead region of Minnesota where a family was gathered for the holidays, and somebody looked out the window and noticed that Bigfoot was just inside the tree line in the woods near their yard, and they're, they had a little Jack Springer Spaniel, I think it was, that started barking its head off and ran outside. And it ran like halfway to where the Bigfoot was, but then it stopped and turned around and came back to the house. And it kept barking, but it, like it wanted to stay by the house for, for safety. But the Bigfoot, you know, on the video, you can see it's just, it starts leaving. It just starts not running, but quickly walking through the woods until it disappears. I'm not 100% sure that video is genuine or not, but I thought the behavior of the dog was interesting because if it was if it was a man in a costume and the whole thing was a hoax, the dog would have known that that was a man in a costume, and I think it wouldn't have been reacting the way that it was. Yeah, that that's interesting. Now, I, I wanted to um, 
I want to ask, like, in some of these uh, sightings, it sounds like you may have some video footage in a few of them, but uh, what's kind of your... So you'll, you'll hear a lot of people, well, let me ask it this way. You'll hear a lot of people say, well, you know, most of the photos or, or video uh, footage captured of Bigfoot is blurry. And, you know, it, <laughs> it's very hard to see, right? You'll get that kind of thing. And you're like, where's the really good footage? So what, what say you about that, you know, that you do have a lot of footage out there that's very blurry and um, kind of difficult often to discern? I've heard a few people make the joke recently that, uh, no, the films aren't blurry. Bigfoot is just a naturally blurry creature. <laughs> so, um, but we do have the famous Patterson-Gimlin film from California from 1967, which I believe is genuine, and I think that's actually pretty good for the conditions under which it was um, filmed. But as for most of the videos and photos you see being kind of blurry, I've taken blurry pictures of just deer and other natural animals, too. It's sometimes it's a, just a product of trying to get a quick snapshot of something that's moving. It just turns out that way. Yeah, and I mean... You... And I did, one of my books that I did was called Big Footage, and it was a um, collection of every report of um, a claim of a photo or a film of a Bigfoot that that I knew of at the time. Uh, and it came out way back in 2000 uh, from all across the country. And there are a lot more photos and videos out there than people are aware of. Um, I, I, Not for a second do I believe that all of them are genuine. There's going to be a lot of hoaxes and uh, mistaken identities in there too, but I think probably at least a few of them are for real. And some are better than others, but I really think it's, it's a product of um, people not being prepared when they see something like that and trying to quickly get their camera ready and um, you know even like I said even with sightings of, of normal animals they, they, they don't always turn out that well yeah and it's interesting because you actually do see from time to time you see some that are you know and, and they're very few and far between it seems like there's very few and far between on the internet that um, as you're researching where you'll see a very clear video or image of one there are a few out there and then you get the flip side of that and well that's just too good or that's just too clear that can't be true <laughs> so so you, you kind of get that yeah, it's well, some, some, some people are just impossible to please i guess <laughs> yes that's true and we hey we I, we were talking before we started here in northern utah we've had our fair share um you know i live up here in northern utah in the ogden area um, Logan's had its fair share of sightings and we've had, um, I've actually covered this on another episode where we talked about weird things going on in Utah. I had another guest on with me and, uh, there were three different, um, Bigfoot, uh, videos that we talked about on that episode. And that was just over about a three year period here. So, uh, I know Northern Utah, we've had our fair share um, what about video evidence for your area? Has there been a lot of it, or is it fairly scarce? There's been just a few videos and photos uh, in Minnesota that I'm aware of. Uh, there was a... Well, there, actually, there's been several kind of enigmatic images captured at the Black Duck site in the past couple of years, because there, there are cameras up um, all the time up there. And... A lot of those seem like the Bigfoot is very aware of the camera and it's it's trying to stay out of sight and there'll be bait put in front of the camera. They mostly peanut butter. They seem to really enjoy peanut butter and they want to get to it, but they're they it's like they understand what the camera is and they're trying to stay low below the camera. And sometimes like there was one picture of a hand reaching up that, that was captured. Or maybe just very top of their head will show up at the bottom of the frame. Um, other than that, as far as photographs go, there was a picture that was in the papers a few years ago um, near a town called Reamer, another trail cam picture, where some hunters had a, a deer camera on a, on a tree that captured 
some kind of upright dark figure passing in front of the camera in the middle of the night, and some people think that it's like a hunter wearing camouflage, and some people think it's a Bigfoot. I, I guess it's some researchers checked it out and uh, were able to establish that it's a little bit taller than the average human. Um, that that picture made headlines. I guess I'm on the fence as to what that shows. And there have been a, just a handful of other photos and videos from Minnesota, but not not a great number. Yeah, I wanted to uh, also touch on, you know, I had one researcher on the show that said he kind of believes that these Sasquatch, Bigfoot, whatever you want to, you know, whatever their name you want to call them, um, seem to kind of have gotten accustomed to, to, to going out at night, to being a little bit maybe more nocturnal. Maybe that makes them a little more elusive. I don't know. What's kind of, from your research, what have you gleaned from it? Do you think they operate more at night, during the day, or, or is that kind of still inconclusive? Well, they're seen both at night and during the day, so I guess it's hard to say. I think they probably just sleep whenever they're tired. Yeah, and I think a lot of people just act, uh, you know, are, are kind of scratching their head. Even if they're kind of, whether they're fully sold on the idea of Bigfoot or not, uh, this whole idea that they're elusive and, you know, they, we've, you know, we've never captured one. We've never, they've never one been shot. At least I'm not aware of it. Uh, and then you always have people say, well, where are the bodies? And what was that last bit? So uh, you you have a lot of uh, of, the, of the people who are, skeptics about this subject that will often say if bigfoot exists how come we have not found a and that's that's a that's a common one but why have we not found a body yet yeah that's a big question and um what proponents of bigfoot the way they usually answer it is that you don't find the naturally dead bodies of other large animals in any great numbers either there was a professor of anthropology in Washington um, several years ago that was one of the few scientists who state that he believed in Bigfoot, and he did a whole study where he surveyed hunters as to how many dead bears they had ever found out in the woods when they were hunting, and he couldn't find a single hunter that had ever found a naturally dead bear um, because nature just consumes dead bodies in not too long an amount of time. But then there's other speculation about, well, maybe Bigfoots carry the bodies of their dead away and do something with them so that they'll never be found. I think I think they're very intelligent creatures, so something like that is certainly possible. And even on top of that, I have read a couple of stories uh, from the Pacific Northwest area of bodies that have been found, or even people who claim to have shot and killed them, and then because they were afraid they were going to get in trouble somehow, they didn't tell anybody right away and just left it where it was. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, number-wise, you know, I've heard some people say maybe there's, in certain areas, uh, you know, maybe there's just not that many of these things. Maybe it's in the hundreds or, you know, a few thousand in certain areas like Pacific Northwest or different areas. And, you know, maybe the verdict's still out on this. What's what's your feeling on it? Do you think maybe there's, you know, not that many of these, these uh, Bigfoot creatures out there? That's another of the biggest areas for speculation. If there are flesh and blood creatures that, breed like any other animal, then I think there's got to be a lot of them out there, and they're just very elusive and very good at not being seen. Um, if there's super low numbers, you're not going to have sightings all across the country the way you have, and um, a species needs to have a certain population level to you know, keep itself going and maintain genetic diversity so you don't have inbreeding going on. I'm no expert on any of that, but, you know, that's what scientists say, that if they are real, there's got to be a fairly large number of them out there. Yeah, and then uh, 
you mentioned that there's sightings all across the U.S. Isn't it true that there's actually sightings of Bigfoot-like creatures around the world? Yeah, um, similar things to Bigfoot, not necessarily identical. Um, of course, there's the Yeti or Abominable Snowman in, in the Himalayas. Um, China has something called the Ye Ren, which means wild man, which seems to be a little bit more human-like than Bigfoot. Uh, Mongolia in that region has what they call the Almas, which has been speculated to maybe be a survival of Neanderthal man. In Australia, they like to give kind of crazy names to creatures in Australia. So their Bigfoot is called the Yowie. That does seem to be pretty similar to America's Bigfoot. Then there's some similar things in Africa and South America too. So yeah, they're, um, there are quite a number of different types out there, or at least stories of them. Yeah, Mike, I wanted to uh, double back to the uh, Patterson Gimlin film. Uh, when did you first see that film, and what was your reaction after first seeing that? I think I probably saw that on TV when I was like six or seven years old. And, um, of course, you're really impressionable then, and you're going to believe anything you see. But from what I've studied about it in the years since then, um, I've never not thought that it was genuine. And it had its 50th anniversary just a few years ago and um, in 2017. And I heard that there was a, they were making a big deal out of it, a big celebration, and researchers were going to have a get-together out there in the, near the around the town of Willow Creek, which kind of builds itself as the capital of the world. That's about 40 miles or so from the spot where the film was shot. So I decided to go out there and, uh, you know, meet people and try and visit the film site. And as it turned out, the, the weather was absolutely terrible when I was there, and I, I got within like a three-quarters mile a hike of the actual film site. I got as far as you can drive. But the weather was so bad, and with the terrain the way it is, I decided it was going to be too dangerous to try and get down there, so I thought, well, I've got to come back here and try again because that stung to get that close to it and not get there. So I went back again just by myself the next year in 2018, and I, the weather was beautiful then, and I got to the film site. So that was kind of a, a big highlight in my life to see that spot. And it has changed a lot over the years, but um, there's been – some research lately to pin down where it, the exact spot is where the creature was walking as you see it in the film and it's they've got like ribbons on trees to mark where the spot is so you can't actually walk the, the same ground that the creature in that film walks on so there's some men out there called they call themselves the Bluff Creek Project and they kind of maintain the site and uh, they'll, if you get a hold of them they'll take people there and give them guided tours so Anybody is uh, a fan of that piece of film and would like to visit the site, I would encourage them to uh, go seek out the Bluff Creek Project because it's it's well worth visiting. Interesting. Yeah, I wanted to. Uh, well, for, let me let me ask this. Uh, you know, aside from the Patterson Gimlin film, which I think many people have considered that, I mean, it's been analyzed backwards and forwards and every other direction. Ha has there been any type of video evidence that you've seen since then, since that Patterson Gimlin film, that is really, you've kind of just been in awe or you think maybe that's totally legit? I don't, I don't know if there have been any that I've been in awe over. Um, there are a few pieces of film I've seen that I think have a likelihood of being genuine. There's a photo called the Zach Hamilton photo from, I believe, 1960 in Oregon, uh, where a woodsman was out in the Three Sisters wilderness, it's called, um, for several days and claimed that this creature stalked him and was always following him wherever he went. It was always close behind him, and he managed to take a few pictures of it, and those were published in a newspaper in Oregon. And it, the one that's been published in books a lot, it just, it's not a perfect picture, but it looks like a gorilla standing upright, and I tend to have positive feelings about that one. 
Um, and there's there's a few pieces of video that I've seen in recent years that I think are quite possibly genuine. Been um, a couple pictures from that Black Duck site uh, that I didn't mention a moment ago that have been pretty impressive. That haven't been just down like body parts down at the bottom of the frame, but have shown almost the whole body of something. But never facing the camera, you can't see its face. There's two shots in particular, one at, at night and one in daylight, where you see the back of what looks like a gigantic creature. And some people are going to, the, the nighttime one in particular, a lot of people think that it's an upright bear. But you can see that it has elbows. It has, its, its forelimbs are bent back pretty far to form elbows, and I don't know, I want, I want to talk to a bear expert who can tell me if a, an upright black bear is able to pull its front legs that far back to look like human arms like that. Um, the daylight shot was captured on a trail cam that was pointed towards a deer stand 250 feet away, which is beyond the range of the motion sensor on the camera, so it was something else that tripped the the camera to go off. It could have been just a branch blowing in the wind or something, but you see what I believe to be a Bigfoot kneeling at the base of this deer stand and kind of looking up at it, and both its arms are up in the air. I had someone tell me that they think it was just an illusion of of leaves forming this, you know, the way you'll sometimes see images in clouds. It's a phenomenon called pareidolia, where they imagine that they're seeing something that's just part of the environment. But this is this the thing in this picture is just so distinctly Bigfoot shaped, and it's the same reddish brown color as one of the creatures that the landowner has has reported seeing a few times. The way its arms are up in the air, and they're both the elbows are bent at the exact points where they should be to be real arms. So yeah, I think those couple of pictures are definitely genuine. Now, Mike, in your latest book, do you include some of that photographic evidence that uh, that you've actually, as part of your research that you've gathered? Sorry, what was that? In your latest book um, that you just mentioned a little while back, do you include some of the photographic evidence that you're talking about now and that you've gathered uh, through your research? Yes, the nighttime shot that I just mentioned is in that book and uh, there's a, a few other pictures of um, like what I was talking about like hands reaching up at the bottom of the frame and, and stuff like that or there's one um, or possibly the top of a Bigfoot's head poking up from behind some leaves like it's crouched down hiding behind bushes and, and so yeah there's uh, half, dozen, half dozen or so pictures like that in the book the daytime shot at the tree stand that I was just mentioning, that happened since the book came out. That, that's, that was pretty recent. Yeah, and I wanted to ask, Mike, you've gathered obviously a lot of uh, witness accounts, uh, um, sightings and, and such, uh, and, and I know you talk about some in the books. Um, are there a few that just really kind of, you know, one, they, they kind of have a wow factor here, and uh, any that you cared to share, maybe one or two? Uh, that you were really kind of taken aback by? Well, the very first case I ever looked into when I was just out of high school was um, something called the Hairy Man of Burgess Trails, which is something that was going on not very far from where I lived when I was a kid, and I never heard about it until I was uh, out of high school. And it, it's basically an urban legend about the way the story goes, it was supposed to have been some hermit that went crazy and went to live in the woods and ended up growing hair all over his body. And he would jump out of cars and scare people at night because Vergas Trails is an area where a lot of kids used to like to go and party and just drive around all night. But when I, it, it just made me wonder, could that be a Bigfoot and not a human hermit? Because even somebody who goes to live like that in the woods is not going to grow hair all over their body. It's just medically impossible. If you're on your head and your face, yeah, your hair will grow longer if you never cut it, but not over your whole body. So it just made me wonder if it might be a Bigfoot. So I started asking questions and was told the names of some people who claimed that they had seen it. 
and I found this one man named Ken Zitzo, who's passed away now, but he lived um, in between Detroit Lakes and Burgess, and he claimed that him and his brother and his brother's girlfriend were out driving through the area one night in 1968, I think it was, and had this eight-foot upright creature that looked like it had the, a human-like body but a gorilla-like head, but with a beard hanging down. Um, just leap out of the ditch into the middle of the road and attack their car. And they, they swerved around it, but then they turned around for another look, and when they came back, it struck out and made a, a dent in the trunk of their car. And then they rounded up all their friends because they were so excited by what they'd seen that they spent the next several months going out and looking for this thing and trying to find where it lived and trying to see it again, and they did spot it a few more times running around in the moonlight and eventually they found what they thought was its den because they found a big hole that had been dug out underneath this old abandoned shack so they set fire to the place and once they burned that old shack down they never saw the thing again and for and so that was my very first bigfoot interview that i ever did and to have it be that exciting of a story uh, it might be kind of unique in the bigfoot field for a fledgling researcher to to start out with that kind of a story. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that, that's quite a story there. You know, there's there's some that believe there may be a supernatural component to this creature. Now, what about the the cases where you get um, you get footprints for a few, maybe I don't know, ten, fifteen, twenty feet, twenty yards, thirty yards, and they just disappear. Have you come across those kind of cases? I had always heard about them, and it's one of the biggest debates in the Bigfoot field, whether the creatures are just flesh and blood, natural animals, or if there's something paranormal about them. And as far as the cases I've investigated for myself, I had never encountered it until this black duck case came along, and there are things like that going on up there. Um, one of the first things that the landowner saw was tracks in snow that, like you just said, uh, just came to an end in the middle of an open area as if the thing had vanished into thin air. And he he certainly thinks that there's something paranormal about them because there are, it's not just Bigfoot sightings going on up there. There are spirit or ghost-like things going on. There's like poltergeist activity that sometimes happens inside the house. There are orbs of light that are seen floating around in the woods. So I've had to... At least say that I'm on the fence about it as to whether there is something paranormal about the creatures themselves or whether paranormal activity of some kind might be going on in the same environment where they are living and they are interacting with it in some way. Um, you know, that they might still actually be flesh and blood but are able to take advantage of whatever, whatever supernatural things are going on around them. Um, yeah, it's been, it's the kind of case that I really never wanted to come across because I was pretty much on the flesh and blood side of the debate for most of the past 30 years and was comfortable there. Um, but this case is just, this is the most intense case I've ever investigated and it's forced me to at least say that I'm on the fence about it now. Yeah, you know, Mike, I wanted to, you know, there's also weird places, and one of them is just a couple of hours from where I live, and that is of Skinwalker Ranch here in, in Utah. And, uh, yeah, that's out in Ballard, Utah. And then you've got Chestnut Ridge, which is another very weird place there in uh, in Pennsylvania. That mountain range uh, stretches for, you know, 100 or so miles down into western Virginia. All kinds of weird stuff going on, but but in both of those areas, people have reported sighting Bigfoot-like creatures, and uh, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna talk Chestnut Ridge in specific here. People have sighted Bigfoot-looking creatures. Uh, some have seen UFO sightings uh, in conjunction with these. Uh, multiple people reporting these things. People shooting at them. And to no effect, uh, some have witnessed Bigfoot-like creatures simply disappear. 
uh, before their eyes. Uh, I think the Native Americans, at least some Native Americans, had talked about Bigfoot-like creatures with some supernatural type abilities. So considering all of that, have you kind of, uh, not just in your area, have you actually read about or researched some of this other stuff like I just mentioned? Yeah, I paid some special attention to the Native American stories, and I've, I've written about that in my books. Um, I used to kind of be of the opinion that that was, you know, a product of their religions, and and that you have to take notice of the fact that they don't only tell those types of stories about Bigfoot, but they have stories about all kinds of animals doing supernatural things in, in their in their tales that they tell. So, you know, what I wrote was that I don't think you can place that much significance on how they they say that Bigfoot is supernatural when they say that all pretty much all animals are supernatural. But I guess in recent times here, since this new case came along, I'm, I'm looking at it a little differently. Um, but I, did, I talked to some, uh, some Sioux Indians down by Red Wing, Minnesota, back in... Um, late 80s or early 90s and because there had been a story in the paper down there about some, some footprints being found on the reservation down there and they said Bigfoot is our big brother he, lo he looks after our tribe when we're having hard times and they call him Kihatonka which means the big man and they told me things like one could walk through this yard right now and if he didn't want to be seen then nobody would see him or, or maybe only one person would see him and i told them about the sighting i had as a kid and they told me well you were the only person in the car that was meant to see it that's why the rest of your family didn't see it and things like that so I, at the time i wasn't quite sure what to think about it but i guess i'm kind of reconsidering it now and I wanted to ask you because it sounds like you've actually also delved into some other kind of unexplained topics, paranormal even related topics you mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, you know, areas where they there have been a lot of Bigfoot sightings, have there been other strange things in some of those areas? Whether it be, you know, similar to I, I mentioned Skinwalker Ranch and Chestnut Ridge where they've had multiple weird things going on. Anything like that that... Uh, you know, UFO sightings, strange lights, uh, you name it, other than what you just mentioned, the one you just mentioned, any of that that you've come across? I have heard of UFO sightings taking place in some of the same areas as Bigfoot sightings in Minnesota, uh, not in large numbers. Um, I haven't heard of any of those kinds of stories where you'll hear that somebody has seen a Bigfoot come out of a landed UFO or stuff like that. But yeah, there's, you know, there's UFO sightings pretty much all across, all around the world. So I have been out collecting Bigfoot stories and then had somebody volunteer, oh, hey, do you want to hear about the UFO that I saw a few years ago? So it, it does happen. Yeah, and I want to do, uh, I want to talk a little bit about, so you've done research for many years. What's, for your actual evidence you've captured, what's been the most compelling? Has it been footprints? Has it been noises recordings what's what's kind of what's kind of the holy grail if you will of uh stuff you've captured over all these years of doing this research there's the whole range of bigfoot evidence has been collected and observed up at the black duck site but prior to that um one of the most impressive things i had seen was back in the early 90s I investigated a case where someone said that he had had three Bigfoot sightings in an area and there was an old uh, set of inactive highline poles that things had been chewing on and tearing pieces off and I found those poles and there were wood splinters all over the ground of every size from tiny ones all the way up to like three feet long. Some of the poles were so damaged they were in danger of falling over and there were these teeth marks all over a lot of them. And they were these twin slashes, like they were from the eye teeth, you know, like the fangs. And I measured them, and they were always three and a half inches apart. Like it was the same mouth that was making all these these marks on these poles. And I had a man with me um, named Ed Trimble, 
he was the the first time that I ever, the only prior time to now that I was able to get access to a private property where repeated Bigfoot activity was going on, this was Ed's place. He was finding Bigfoot tracks, and he reported it to the DNR, and they referred him to me. And so I went up and met him, and we became friends. And he was an old retired uh, trapper and tracker who knew all there was to know about the woods. So he got very interested in Bigfoot and collecting stories himself once he had his findings, so me and him went to investigate the, this Peace Mark case together, and he used to hunt bears for bounty, and he had some bear skulls stored in his garage, so when we got back to his place, we did a measurement on the biggest skull, the biggest bear he had ever shot, and the, the eye teeth were only about an inch and a half apart, so the mouth of whatever was chewing on those poles was over twice as wide as a bear's mouth is. And we were finding those marks all the way from a few inches above the ground to over seven feet up. Well, I'd like to say that's some of the most impressive physical evidence that I've personally found. Because it wasn't a bear that did that, at least not a black bear, and that's the only species of bear native to Minnesota. So you have to think, what else could it be? Either a big grizzly, which we don't have in Minnesota, or... Some something other than Bigfoot that nobody has even imagined yet, or Bigfoot itself, which had been reported seen at least three times right around where those poles were. So that seems to me to be the most likely explanation. Wow, wow, well, that's uh, that's interesting stuff. Well, uh, Mike, uh, interesting stuff and a lot of good work. It sounds like you're doing there. Um, where? Uh, I, I think your books are on Amazon. Talk about where people can find your books, where they can find out more about your work. Yep, Amazon is the best place to find it. I have four books for sale on there. Uh, any websites, uh, any way people can reach out to you if they want to contact you, anything like that? I can uh, give you my email address, mqstk at aol.com. All right, great. And again, can you mention the the name of the most recent book that you were just talking about for, for the listeners? It's called Sasquatch Central, High Strangeness at a Northern Minnesota Homestead. Okay, and this was the location that you were just talking about where you captured some of the the uh, the interesting footage or evidence, that uh, the, including the photo that you mentioned. Is that correct? Yes, and it, the activity is still ongoing there, and uh, I'm going to be going up there again on Saturday after Thanksgiving and uh, doing some hiking around and seeing if we can find uh, even more evidence. Like I said, the latest actual sighting up there happened just on Halloween. Interesting, yeah, fairly recently. Wow. Well, that's good stuff. Uh, hey, Mike, uh Thank you for the work you do, and um, yeah, anybody want to check out the books? They're there on Amazon. Uh, last name, Q-U-A-S-T, how do you spell it? So Mike Quast, I think, is uh, what's listed on your books. Is that correct? Uh, is, the, is your author name? Yeah, that's right. Okay, all right. Find those on Amazon. All right, Mike, well, uh, thank you so much for taking the time and uh, talking with me tonight. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a great night, Mike.